So, um, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Oral for the invitation to give this talk and um, of course for him and his team uh, for all their efforts to turn this workshop, which I look forward to every year, into a virtual meeting. Um, I'm very sorry that I cannot do this live this year, um, but I don't have childcare uh, because of the situation that we're all in and um, I have to take care of my little girl. Okay, so... Um, I'm interested in neural circuit mechanisms that process visual information. And my lab, uh, and in my lab, we use the fly visual system as a model to study various aspects of vision at the level of single cells and small neural circuits. And today I'll be focusing on the question of how we perceive color in particular. So why study color vision in the first place? Uh, color adds a perceptual dimension to our visual experience. Um, if you look at this, a grayscale image, you can see that um, there's a tree, and if you uh, pay really close attention, you're going to see that there are uh, 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 fruits that are hanging among the foliage. Um, but if I add color, then uh, the pomegranates really pop out of the picture, and if you're an animal that's looking for food, uh, then you're much better off with color vision. So color helps us understand uh, complex visual scenes, uh, and as such, it's a very important part of our sensory experience. Um, in addition, uh, color is a really, is a particularly fascinating problem in visual neuroscience because as uh, you, you all might have heard, color only exists in the brain. Uh, this is because color is not an inherent property of uh, an object, unlike its shape, for example, but a color is rather, um, um, uh, color rather depends on three things. The illumination source, um, the reflectance properties of the object, and importantly, for what I'm going to be telling you today, uh, on the neural circuit mechanisms that process light as it's reflected from uh, the object. So really, color depends on the observer. And the question I'm interested in is how are colors encoded in the brain? So one of the most important concepts in uh, color vision is the principle of univariance. And it's very simple. If you consider uh, the spectral sensitivity curve of this uh, blue photoreceptor, um, which is the probability of, uh, of absorbing a photon as a function of wavelength, and you shine a, a purple light that's close to its peak uh, or a more intense green light that's close to its tail, the response of the photoreceptor will be the same. There's definitely a uh, confusion between intensity and wavelength. And because of this, an observer that only has one type of photoreceptor is going to be colorblind um, and uh, basically see the world in grayscale, right? Um, the way that visual systems are thought to deal with this is to add a second photoreceptor that, ex that um, expresses different uh, opsin type. Uh, which will respond differently to these different um, combinations of wavelength and intensity. And as long as these signals here are compared somewhere downstream in the brain, then uh, uh, the brain can make sense of this and basically uh, dissociate the information about color from that uh, of intensity. And um, this comparison is apparent in very uh, special neurons that are called color opponent neurons that get antagonistic inputs from uh, two different types of photoreceptors and are activated by a range of wavelengths and inhibited by a different range of wavelengths. And color opponent neurons with this type of tuning have been described in many different uh, animals. Uh, and what we know about uh, spectral processing um, uh, is really uh, comes from work for, in trichromatic primates. So there, um, um, cones come in three flavors, uh, um, um, short, medium, and long wavelengths uh, cones. And these signals are compared in the retina and in the LGN um, uh, into uh, two axes. One that uh, compares M versus L uh, cone outputs, which is this red-green opponent um, uh, axes, and one that co compares M plus L versus uh, uh, S, which is this blue-yellow uh, opponent axis. Then if you look deeper in the brain, uh, in cortex, there's these really interesting neurons that are called uh, hue-specific. Uh, they respond to a very narrow uh, uh, range of wavelengths, and importantly, their intensity invariance. 
Um, and so the mechanisms that lead from cones themselves to color opponency are pretty well understood at this point. Um, however, the mechanisms that lead from cone opponency to um, hue selectivity are really not well understood. Uh, in addition, um, the, 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 the link between these neurons and, um, sorry, and um, the perception of color itself is really at this much, pretty much, uh, at this point, pretty much unknown. And so, um, of course, uh, this is a very uh, complex um, question that is hard uh, to um, study in the, the complicated brain of mammals, uh, where the lack of genetic tools are also kind of hindered progress. And so this is where my favorite model organism comes in, the fruit fly. It's been a, a really wonderful model to study visual processing in general, but not, not very much has been done in terms of color processing, of wavelength processing. Um, they have wavelength guided behaviors. Uh, they have the hardware for color vision and they have a circuit that uh, is well poised to um, uh, support color vision. And uh, the, the basic idea in my lab is um, to basically harness uh, the powerful genetic tools that are available in flies combined with all the anatomical knowledge that we have about this kind of compact brain to extract general principles of wavelength encoding. And so today I'm going to be telling you about the first efforts from my lab to um, establish um, the fly as a model organism for uh, color vision. So behavior first. So flies are phototactic. They like light. They like more intense light. Uh, and that is true irrespective of wavelength, green, uh, UV. Uh, however, uh, when comparing the responses to different wavelengths, a couple of interesting features uh, appear. Uh, the first one is um, that when given a choice between the same number of photons of UV and green light, for example, flies are going to always choose the UV. Um, so this is uh, called a spectral preference. In addition, when we start uh, mixing uh, wavelengths, uh, another interesting uh, property uh, emerges, which is a phototactic inversion, where flies choose UV light alone over a mixture of UV plus green light, even though this side, the one with the mixture, is more intense. Um, and so um, the behaviors I just told you about all, are all innate behaviors. Uh, there's been a little bit of uh, a, a learning that has been done as well. Um, so it's been shown that uh, flies can learn uh, blue versus green uh, in an associative learning assay uh, where one of the colors is paired with sugar. And uh, so this is the learning index in this, in, this, in this case. And they can do so independently of intensity, uh, which is an important feature. So I'm not going to tell you um, anything else about behavior. It's an important part of uh, the work that we're doing in the lab, and we're not quite there yet. I will just say that there's, uh, this is um, uh, not very much uh, that's been done. Um, and uh, there's uh, kind of the space of wavelengths and intensities and the types of assays that can be uh, performed with flies. Um, um, there's a lot that uh, we need to actually explore. So let's put this aside uh, and hopefully I can tell you more about it you know, next time I give a talk. So I'm gonna move on and talk to you about the hardware. Um, just a brief introduction about the fly visual system. So fly eyes are made up of uh, 800 unit eyes called omatidia. Each of them corresponds to one pixel in the field of view of the animal. Uh, and each omatidium uh, is um, composed of eight photoreceptors called R1 to 8. This is an EM cross section here. Um, and when you look at it uh, from the side, it looks like this uh, R1 to 6 form a trapezoid around R7 and R8 that sit on top of each other. R7 and R8, because of this configuration, actually are in the same uh, path of light. So they look at the same point in space, something that will be important uh, as I move on during my talk. Um, so R1 to 6 are um, involved in achromatic vision. They all express the same opsin. 
um, and R7 and R8 express different types of opsins and are the, the cone-like neurons, uh, photoreceptors of, of flies. And so there's actually two types of omectidia uh, depending on um, the, um, the, the opsin that are expressed uh, at the level of R7 and R8. R7s express one of three UV opsins, RH3 or RH4. And R8 expresses uh, either the blue RH5 or the green RH6, and it, they always come in these two pairs. And these are distributed stochastically in the eye of the fly. And here are the spectral sensitivity curves. So the gray one is RH1, which is expressed in R1 to 6, and the four that I told you about. So you don't have to remember any of this. I'll have little cheat sheets, uh, little uh, uh, pictures on the corners of my slides whenever um, they're necessary for comprehension, obviously. Okay, so these uh, photoreceptors send their axons to the optic lobe uh, where visual processing happens. R1 to 6, which are the, the achromatic ones, send their axons to the lamina, which is the first neuropil, R R7 and R8, the, go through the lamina and uh, send their axons to the medulla. Um, lobular and lobular plate are two different, um, the neuropils that are involved in, in, in uh, higher order processing. So um, I'm going to be switching to kind of more of a, a schematics now. Um, so um, I want to point your attention now to the axons of R7 and R8 here in the medulla. Oh no, sorry. So what I wanted to say first is that what we care about is how uh, visual, how uh, uh, wavelength signals and um, any other signals that uh, deal with color perception are uh, processed in the visual system of the fly. And again, it's really uh, quite a bit of an unknown at this point. So now I want to point your attention to the axons of R7 and R8 in the medulla. So um, there, R7 and R8 target two different layers of the medulla. And each, but each pair of R7 and R8 from the same omitidium uh, occupies the same column in the medulla. And a column is, a, um, is basically a unit of visual processing um, corresponding to one point in space, one pixel in the visual field of the M. And so a few years ago, EM reconstructions identified um, axoaxonal synapses between R7 and R8 that come from the same column. And something that I haven't told you yet is that uh, photoreceptors in flies uh, depolarize to light and are inhibitory. And so um, these were actually really interesting um, uh, uh, synapses uh, because of course uh, they very, were very well poised to support color opponency, which I told you about earlier, which are really the building blocks of color vision. And uh, last year, there was actually a really a nice paper that showed that um, these actually do lead to color opponency at the level of the outputs of uh, R7 and R8 photoreceptors. So this is where we're at. So I just want to kind of recap what I've told you so far. Um, we have a, at the level of the retina, we have a 2D array of light sensing rhabdomeres. So I just kind of um, depicted a kind of a random array of uh, pale and yellow omitidia. Uh, here, uh, they express four different types of opsins, ranging from UV to green, and they're randomly distributed in the eye. Okay. Um, their axons are in the medulla, where antagonistic, antagonistic interactions happen between R7 and R8 from the same omitidium, looking at the same point in space. So now there are very many questions that we want to answer here. Um, at this first level of processing. The first one is, can we measure the axonal tuning, spectral tuning curves of each of these different photoreceptor types? And then can we relate this back to the architecture of the circuit itself? Then can we mathematically define the transformation that happens between the responses at the level of the eye and those at the level of axons? And can we build a model that can explain this transformation that uh, can also take into account the architecture of the circuit. And finally, you know, kind of the question that I mostly am interested in is what is all this for? Okay, so the first question that I'm going to tackle is can we measure these axonal tuning curves? Um, so for this, uh, here are our methods. 
So here are the sensitivities of uh, the opsins themselves first. And then um, we wanted to be able to excite each one of these opsins as independently as possible. So we chose six different LED uh, lights, a deep UV, UV, violet, blue, green, and orange, that we combine into this uh, LED mixer that we can present, that can help us present uh, different wavelengths of, of light alone or in combination to a fly as it's mounted under uh, the objective of a two-photon microscope. Then what we want to do is to measure a tuning curve uh, of our 7 and R8. And ideally, what we would do is show all these different, very narrow uh, uh, ranges of uh, light sources and um, measure the responses of our 7 and R8 axons to each of these different light sources. But we only have six uh, LEDs. So how do we do this? So if you consider uh, one of these wavelengths or light sources, um, we can calculate the photon capture that this light source will elicit for each of the different opsins, which is just a measure of how well a light source activates a given opsin, which gives us a five-dimensional vector in this uh, photon capture space. Then the idea is to use the principle of univariance that uh, states that once a photon is absorbed by the visual system, its identity is completely lost to mimic the effect of this wavelength by a combination, by instead showing a combination of the LEDs that we have in our setup. So the way that we do this is that um, uh, we just run a simple linear re regression to get the weights, that is to say the intensities uh, that should be associated with each of the different wavelengths in order to get as close as possible to the same five dimensional vector. And just this is a complicated way to tell you that this works very much like the screens that you watch every day, uh, which only have three LEDs and um, can give us the illusion of seeing, you know, thousands of hues. Okay, so this is our um, stimulus system. Now, um, when we come to uh, the actual recordings, uh, we image here the level of the medulla, and uh, we use uh, um, GAL4 lines, which are expressed in each of these different opsin, uh, in each of these different photoreceptors to drive GCAM 6F. And here are uh, just uh, some raw the data. Each of these little ROIs is one axonal terminal, and you can see, for example, this UV specific one responds to UV and not to growing green. Okay, so um, now. The data. So um, here is just a sample of uh, the responses that we get uh, for each of the photoreceptor types uh, to three different wavelengths. So uh, pale R7s are activated by UV, and now you can see that there's uh, inhibition to blue and green, um, and so on. Um, so we can basically take each of these uh, uh, responses and build the tuning curve that I told you about. And here are uh, here is the data. So um, three of these opsins, uh, pale R7, yellow R7, and yellow R8, basically compare uh, the UV part of the spectrum and the vis visible part, which is the visible part for us. So basically comparing UV to blue and green, uh, pale R7s are activated, yellow R7s are activated by UV, uh, whereas uh, yellow R8s are activated by green. Uh, pale R8s uh, have this kind of curious shape where they're trilobed, um, they're activated by blue, as we would imagine, and, but they're inhibited by both the UV and the green part of the spectrum. Okay, so this was really um, exciting to us to be able to actually see these responses in this tuning curve, uh, but we also wanted to measure the rhabdomeric responses so that later on, as I told you, we, we would like to uh, be able to relate the two. And so since we can't uh, directly record in the retina with our system, what we did was instead to use a genetic trick that uh, allows us to measure um, axonal responses in an animal where only the photoreceptor that we're recording from is active. So basically these cell autonomous responses should correspond to purative rhabdomeric responses. And here is uh, the data. So uh, as, as you would have imagined, you know, we don't see any inhibition anymore since in these flies there's only one photoreceptor type that's active, um, but we see responses in the range that we would have predicted by uh, uh, the, the opsin that they actually uh, express. Um, then um, 
an, in, an interesting point is that these curves should be directly related to the spectral sensitivity of the opsins that they express. And this relationship have, is, has been shown by others to correspond to a single, si simple log transformation of photon capture. Um, and so uh, what we did is to calculate this uh, log of Q for each of these different uh, uh, tuning curves. And when we overlay them, we're very happy to see that they actually as this hopper and pose, which um, is a nice control of our methods, but it's also something, a tool, a mathematical tool that we're going to use later on um, to do some of the modeling. So I'll remind you of this later. So, okay, so now we have um, spectral tuning curves for each of these photoreceptor outputs. Um, let me find my cursor again. There you go. Um, and uh, now um, we wanted to relate, as I said, these responses to the circuits. And I'm gonna take you through some uh, genetic manipulations that, um, that help us uh, ask this question. So first of all, um, here is uh, the tuning curve. So I'm gonna be focusing on PALR7 and PALR8. We've done the experiments for uh, uh, all of these um, uh, photoreceptor types. So if we look at PALR7 in wild type, um, we see, as, as I mentioned, that uh, they're activated by UV and inhibited by blue and green. Um, so now I'm showing it in, in, in black so that we can compare. Uh, now in a fly where only PALR7 and PALR8 are active, so only this uh, deep UV and this blue opsins uh, of, are active, um, we, we still see opponency in the blue range, but we lose opponency in the green range. If we uh, have a fly with only pale R7s and yellow R8s active, uh, uh, you, see, you still see inhibition over the same range as the wild type. Now, if we have only R7s active, you still see a bit of inhibition in the blue range, but nothing uh, in uh, the green range and in the kind of uh, uh, blue-green range. Um, now moving on to um, PALR8. Uh, so this is again the wild type with opponency in both the UV and the green range, again in black to compare. Now again, if we have only PALR7s and PALR8s, there is opponency uh, that, is, um, that remains in the UV but is lost in the green range. And the opposite is true when you only have yellow R8s and PALR8s active. Um, if we do the yellow R7 PLR8 experiment, we still see a bit of uh, opponency uh, here in the U uh, as compared to uh, the actual response of the of the the, the opsin itself. Okay, so now uh, going back to our model, um, you know, I'm sure you all have figured out that there's something that doesn't fit here because. Um, in this model here, when there's only interactions between uh, uh, R7 and R8 from the same omatidium, if you look at these uh, axons, um, they should be getting some in inhibitory input from, at least from uh, uh, yellow uh, R8, so the ones that express the green opsin. Um, and so um, to explain the data that I just showed you. So in order to be able to uh, account for uh, the results of our uh, experiments, we need to um, propose the existence of a horizontal cell-like interneuron that would basically link different uh, photoreceptors that neighbor each other uh, in an in antagonistic way. So basically this neuron should be postsynaptic to R7 and R8, but also feeds back, feedback on, onto them. And so we went back to the EM and we found uh, that there was actually such a neuron that was identified called DM9. So DM9 is both, both pre and postsynaptic to R7 and R8. Uh, RNA seq data is consistent with this cell being excitatory, which is necessary for a model to keep kind of the net antagonism between uh, photoreceptors uh, 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 there. Um, so this is a clone of uh, DM9. It looks like this. It has arborizations that uh, 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 flank M M1, M3, and M6. It's exactly where photoreceptors are. And if you co-stain a single uh, clone of DM9 and these uh, photoreceptors in blue, you see that they're very uh, uh, nicely in close proximity. 
Um, in addition, an important um, piece of information is that each DM9 on average uh, 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 occupies seven columns. Um, then um, the first thing that we wanted to do is to um, basically um, confirm the fact that DM9 uh, uh, has inputs onto our seven NR. And so to do this, oh no, sorry, yes. So um, what is also important is that uh, DM9 has no preference for either pale or yellow. It also, um, it basically um, inhabits columns that uh, are both pale and yellow. As you can see here, this is one clone of DM9. It's a small DM9 that has probably nine or five columns. Uh, but as you can see, uh, it occupies both uh, 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 yellow and green and pale columns in blue here. Okay, so as I, as I was starting to mention, we wanted to know to make sure that DM9 actually is presynaptic functionally to R7 and R8. So what we did was to express uh, crimson in DM9. Um, and um, we did this in blind flies so that uh, the, the orange red light that, that we shine to activate crimson would not activate the visual system. Uh, and we recorded from pale r And this is what we get. So this is uh, uh, the activation uh, uh, of DM, uh, of, of R7, of pale R7 when DM9 is activated. And in control flies, we don't see any. Um, then uh, after this, we wanted to actually measure the tuning curve of DM9, which we hypothesized would be pretty broadband since it gets inputs from all our seven NRAs. And this is what we see. Uh, DM9 is inhibited, of course, because our seven NRAs are inhibitory by a, a large range of wavelengths that uh, basically spans the, 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 what the light that flies can see. Okay, so then, uh, the important experiments were also to test for necessity and sufficiency. And so, first of all, we tested for necessity. So uh, we use pale R8 because it's a pretty nice um, uh, um, control or nice uh, uh, neuron to actually look at this because uh, the opponency that originates from interometidial, so between different columns, be between different, um, be between R7 and R8 from different omatidia is uh, kind of physically separated in this tuning curve from um, opponency that originates from both inter and intra uh, omatidial uh, op opponency, which is uh, here in the UV. So here again is the control, it's our control of uh, pale R8. Um, if, um, again, in black so we can compare, um, we compare now to a situation well where DM9 is silent. So we use CUR 2.1 expressed in DM9 and reported from pale R8. So in this case, we lose the green opponency and uh, we keep the sum of the UV inhibition, which makes sense because now we only have opponency here that's driven by direct interactions between pale R7 and pale R8, but we lose those coming from uh, uh, yellow R7 and yellow R8. So uh, then we wanted to test sufficiency. In order to do this, um, we started with flies in this case. These are not wild type flies. They're flies where uh, we um, inhibit photoreceptor signaling completely using histamine channel mutants, uh, as, as shown here. Uh, of course, there's no opponency at this level for pale R8. Um, and now what we can do is rescue histamine signaling. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure I told you, but for receptor is histaminergic. So that's why they're inhibitory. So if we um, rescue histamine signaling only uh, in uh, DM9, then we recover only the synapses that go from photoreceptors to DM9. And, and so in this case, only interometidial interactions are restored. And in this case, um, we recover the opponency in the green and also some opponency in uh, uh, the UV, showing sufficiency. Okay, so going back to our kind of model slide, uh, so we have this dual circuit that's composed of, of direct intraometidial antagonistic interactions between R7 and R8 and indirect interometidial antagonistic interactions between the horizontal cell DM9. 
So um, now we have a qualitative description of this circuit, but what we wanted was to have a quantitative understanding of this first step in processing. And so the question, as I said, is can we mathematically define the transformation between uh, a rhabdomeric response and external responses and build a model of the circuit that takes into account the architecture. So, but before getting into the circuit architecture, we wanted to um, ask if we could express um, axonal responses as a simple linear sum of uh, rhabdomeric responses. That would be kind of the, the, the simplest transformation that could happen. You could just add up uh, these responses or subtract them um, and get uh, the, the, the axonal responses. And so um, what we did uh, was to perform a linear regression with no biological constraints using our calculated rhabdomeric responses, log of Q, which as I mentioned earlier, basically represent putative uh, rhabdomeric responses. Uh, and so when we compared the, the predicted linear sum uh, which is down here, uh, with our measured responses, they fall under the unity line, which shows that indeed there's a linear transformation that can account for this neural transformation. And so then we could use uh, uh, this um, as a benchmark for further modeling. So I'm showing you here the, the, the actual curves themselves. So this, this, this uh, in orange is the linear regression, the unconstrained linear regression uh, that I just told, told you about. And here we have a histogram of the cross-validated R, R2 um, values. Um, R squared, sorry, values. Um, so, okay, so we use this as a benchmark, as I mentioned. And so the next thing that we did is um, to ask if we could constrain the model with the circuit architecture um, that is schematized here on the left. Uh, so we build a linear recurrent network that is constrained by circuit connectivity uh, and the synaptic signs, um, and we fit the steady state responses of this model to our measured uh, amplitudes. And so we call this the fully parameterized model. And uh, when constrained by this architecture, our model has a goodness of fits that that's comparable to uh, uh, the unconstrained linear re re regression, even though um, the fully parameterized model has fewer parameters than the unconstrained regression. Then the second question I wanted to ask, uh, we're kind of curious about is, um, can the synaptic counts that are measured by EM, which is something that we think about in terms of the strength of uh, uh, interactions, can they serve as a proxy for the synaptic weights in this model? So uh, we build this uh, synaptic count model by just plugging in uh, 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 those weights. Uh, so it's a zero parameter model, which uh, qu qualitatively did uh, uh, okay, but quantitatively doesn't, did not do very well. However, a caveat of this uh, model, I think this is missing, there you go. This is the synaptic count model. So it didn't do really very well. The caveat of this model is that um, because we don't have any uh, fitted parameters, we are uh, assuming that the gain of each one of these different neurons is the same, which is not actually really plausible. So we build a different model, one last model, which is the so-called synaptic count plus gain model, where we only fit five parameters, which are the gains of each one of these different um, uh, 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 neurons. And in this case, uh, the model does really well, uh, just as well almost as the, the, the linear re regression. And when we look at the weights themselves, the, the gains themselves, they actually make sense. They're very similar for each one of these of the photoreceptor and are larger for DM9. Um, then finally, we also wanted to ask, you know, is it possible that the model is so robust that you know you can plug in any gains and action any weights, sorry, for the synapses and actually uh, get a decent result. Um, and that's actually not the case because when we uh, replaced uh, the weights in our model uh, with randomly drawn weights that were drawn from a uniform distribution, um, we found that uh, our model did significantly better uh, than using random weights, which shows that really uh, we, can, uh, we can use, at least at this level of the circuit, the, sy the synaptic count data retrieved from EM 
uh, as a good proxy for uh, uh, in the, the, the strength of the inputs between these different uh, photoreceptor types and DM9, which uh, I think is a really uh, a cool uh, result. Okay, so we're back to our uh, model. I have no idea how long I've been going, so hopefully we're good. <laughs> So um, we, we have a circuit, we have a model uh, that explains our data. But now kind of the question that I think is really interesting is what is all this for? What does this do? Um, so the first thing that we did to answer this question was to compute the correlation coefficients between the different photoreceptors at the level of the raptomuse. Um, and you can see uh, the coefficient, co there, these responses are very correlated, right? And it makes sense because as, as you saw, there's a high degree of overlap between uh, the spectral sensitivity curves of each of these different uh, uh, opsins. And now we can do the same thing at the level of the axons, and this is what we find. Uh, basically, there's much less correlation at the axonal level, at the output of the photoreceptors than at their input. So this is really a useful thing um, in terms of a, a, a signal processing. Um, and so, um, okay, so, and, but then the next question is, um, it, the system could decorrelate the, these responses in many different ways. And why does it do it the way that it does? Or in other words, why do the opponent responses actually vary along these two axes that I told you about, one that is UV versus visible and the other blue versus UV and green? And so we were, um, sorry, so this is the conclusion. We were inspired that by work that was done in, uh, uh, um, in, in humans uh, by, uh, Boschbaum and Gottschalk uh, in the 80s, um, which shows that uh, when you perform PCA on the spectral sensitivity of uh, human cones, uh, what uh, you get is uh, uh, the two major uh, opponent axes that are measured at the level of the retina and the, the LGN, which suggests that opponent circuits Per, per, perform an optimal transformation of photoreceptor responses. Um, and so um, in that they really achieve di a, a, a dimensionality re reduction with maximal uh, uh, information preservation. And so, as I said, we're inspired by uh, this really nice study. And we basically did the same in, with, the, with, 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 with fly um, spectral sensitivities uh, uh, from RH3 to RH6, and this is what we find. So the first um, uh, principal component, of course, is achromatic, and it, and it explains uh, over half of the variance. Uh, the second PC, uh, which we call C1, uh, compares uh, uh, RH3 plus RH4 uh, with uh, RH5 and RH6. Uh, basically opposing UV uh, with uh, blue-green. Um, then the third PC, which we call C2, the second chromatic PC, uh, opposes uh, a blue to UV and to uh, green. And so both of these PCs together explain 97% of the variance. Then the last PC is this more complicated one, which uh, compares deep UV with UV and blue to green. Uh, and so when we, when we look at these uh, uh, PC C1 and C2 um, at the level and compare them to uh, the responses that we actually measure, uh, it's really interesting that they actually align with uh, the responses of, uh, in the case of C1, of uh, R7s and yellow R8, and in the case of uh, C2 with pale R8. So again, just like in the primate retina, by aligning with the, these two axes, uh, opponent mechanisms not only efficiently decorrelate chromatic signals, but they also retain uh, maximum chromatic information, which is really important for the for um, uh, uh, signal processing. 
Okay, so now, lastly, um, everything that I've told you has been focused on the full field properties of these responses because this is what we could measure. Um, however, the circuit, even though we haven't measured them, uh, implies a specific structure in terms of the spatial chromatic uh, receptor fields of each of these different photoreceptor outputs. And I uh, thought it'd be nice to compare to the retina of uh, uh, primates where, you know, we all know that each uh, uh, cone gets antagonistic inputs from neighboring cones through uh, horizontal cells and that these interactions uh, form a receptive field um, organization with a, with, a, with a center and an antagonistic surround that you're all familiar with. And basically we have the same situation in the fly, but be, before I get to this, I wanna kind of touch upon one of the, the, the new opponent axes that is found in uh, the primate retina, which is uh, supported by midget cells. Uh, and in this case, um, when you consider the fact that, you know, there's a random distribution of uh, blue, uh, green, and red with a majority of, 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 of uh, green and red cones in the fovea, uh, and if you overlay this on this very simplistic cartoon, uh, basically what you get is by chance, sometimes you're gonna get a, a center that is driven by, uh, you know, a single cone in the, fo in the fovea and um, so, surrounded by a majority of, uh, uh, of in this case, uh, uh, L cones. And so this uh, structure is going to uh, give you a receptive field structure that is spatially uh, opponent in addition to cone opponent. In this case, for, for we can get like an M uh, uh, minus L plus uh, uh, surround. Um, and so when we look at our uh, system, uh, what we can do is actually, even though we can't measure these uh, spatial properties, the spatial chromatic properties, we can model them. We can pr predict their structure thanks to our model again. So what we can do is basically uh, 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 predict these. And so this is what uh, we've done. So uh, in each uh, case for pale R7s, um, for, for all photoreceptor types, we see a, um, a, a, a bilobed opponent center that uh, compares uh, UV and visible light, um, and a broadband surround that's driven by DM9 uh, that is basically has its uh, strongest uh, response between maybe 350 and uh, 550 uh, nanometers. And so just depicted the same way as I've done here for mammals, this is what it, what, uh, it would like, look, look like. So, um, of course, uh, the first thing that we want to do is to actually verify this and measure these uh, spatial chromatic uh, 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 properties um, using a pattern stimulus. Um, and then really the next question is, how uh, does this uh, chromatic and spatial information become an, an untangled downstream and uh, uh, um, visual pathway, which is something that we're really interested in. So I'm gonna conclude uh, uh, now. So we have defined a, a dual circuit for opponents here at the level of photoreceptor outputs. So an insect specific circuit that compares wavelengths at each point in space and mediate and is mediated by this direct axo-axonal synapses um, and a uh, evolutionarily convergent circuit that compares uh, uh, wavelengths at different points in space that is mediated by this uh, horizontal cell uh, like DM9 neuron. Uh, we show that all together these um, uh, these, these two circuits allow for the visual system of the flight to build kind of an efficient yet comprehensive representation of uh, chromatic information um, and are predicted to give rise to kind of a complex spatial, uh, recept spatial chromatic receptive field. Um, and so, of course, the next step for us is to look downstream and we're very lucky uh, that we have a lot of EM data that you know gives us a roadmap, and here are the neurons that we're uh, currently um, imaging from, uh, patching from, in response to many different types of uh, stimuli. Some that I've told you about, and others that we're um, building right now, looking not just at uh, uh, wavelength information, but also intensity, uh, spatial and temporal information. And of course, uh, we want to eventually go into the central brain and. Un 
understand how uh, all these signals um, drive uh, uh, behavior. Okay, so uh, at this point, uh, I would like to first of all, and I should have done this at the start, uh, thank um, my two wonderful graduate students, Sarah Heath and uh, Matthias Christensen, who basically drove this whole project and are uh, the first co-authors co in this paper that we published in January. Um, which, you know, they're really wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful students. I'm lucky to have them. Um, and also, of course, the rest of the lab. Uh, Alvar and Maya are working on DM8, which is an amicron cell, uh, and Jesse and Jacob, uh, who are um, working on uh, different aspects of vision, uh, motion vision, and neuromodulation. I want to thank a um, bunch of people. Uh, Larry Abbott for helping us with some of the modeling, Darcy Paterkia who's helped us so much with imaging, anything that involves light, Rick uh, who helped us with uh, a lot of the building of things and um, the FLY community in general for being such a generous and a wonderful place to be and um, funders if I didn't mention and you here because I am uh, recruiting uh, postdocs and graduate students so if you are interested and excited about understanding how small neural circuits uh, perform interesting computations um, uh, then uh, send me an email. So um, again, I'm very sorry that I could not be there uh, live. Um, I guess please uh, email me with questions and uh, I'd be very happy to talk to any of you. So um, enjoy the rest of the meeting and um, stay safe. Uh, thank you.